So I'm going to, to be talking about something that uh, most of us suffer, uh, some endure, and a very few enjoy. That is the, our relationships with the journals. And the journals, not only in the field of education, but in general. And I'm going to try to entertain you for the first part and then depress you in the last part. And hopefully, in the last two minutes, a little bit of uh, hopeful thinking. Um, publish and impoverish. Uh, I need to know a little bit about you, the audience, uh, to, to make it a you know, to connect better with your realities. Uh, please raise your hand if you have published in a high impact factor journal more than five articles in the last 10 years. Five articles, high impact factor journals. No, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Feel great you are in the great majority of the scholarly community. We are the majority. This is not a democracy, but we are a democracy. So, what's, uh, I'm going to be asking a, simple, a series of simple questions, but the answers are a little bit more complicated. So, some of the things that we will be exploring is why do we need to count citations, uh, who does the counting, what counts in that counting, and who pays for the counting. So, the first thing is that all over the world, the big challenge is this, defining impact. And this definition of impact has been called by many as the metric tide. In the last 20 years, 16 countries have developed and implemented laws that try to regulate the science and development field uh, very concerned with issues of accountability. And you can see 1985, the United Kingdom, and now we have another large number and countries that were not very concerned with this are now discussing these issues. Uh, we have the case of Argentina that had an attempt uh, two years ago to, to create a, a new law uh, that is not very successful. Uh, in Mexico, this is a topic of great discussion. In Brazil, it's a very high concern. And is anything here that calls your attention? a country that you will expect to be there and is not? The United States is not there. And the, the funny part is that I have been doing these things about talking scholarly communications in many countries, really many, many countries, and in most of those countries I always get the same answer. We are doing this because we want to be like the Americans. I was like, well, the Americans are not doing that. So, I'm not sure what you are copying. Anyway, um, this issue of the, the measuring the impact is correlated with two issues. One is the university rankings and the importance of those indicators, uh, the importance of the journals in the indicators for the journal rankings. And now I'm showing two maps. The first is that the traditional world university rankings uh, by the Times Higher Education, but the countries are adjusted by national wealth. And so what you can see is that countries that are wealthier uh, have apparently better universities. And if you look the map at the bottom that was created by Juan Pablo Alperin, a colleague that also works in the Public Knowledge Project, uh, the countries are adjusted by the number of journals in the Web of Science Index. So, when you put the two maps together, the correlation is really, really good. So, what we know in this use of the journals is that certain countries uh, have very clear advantages in this issue. But we are using the journals to create, or, you know, to create the rankings. So, why do we do that? 
And why do we start doing this since 1986? Well, it's, some people think that by competing in this uh, system of uh, publications, uh, we are going to improve the quality and we are going to improve the quantity. And this is one of the issues that I would like to interrogate. So, something that you know. In the higher education rankings, there are four things that matter. Publications, something that we can count, really easy, no problem. Funding, the amount of money that we get, very easy to count. In the last 10 years, there is an explosion of awards. You, if you live in the US, and you want to get promotion to full professor, the highest ranking, now you need to have awards. It doesn't matter how many citations, it doesn't matter how many uh, high esteem publications you have, you need to have awards. If you don't have awards, you are not going to be promoted. And we start to get a little bit more complicated here with the awards, but every single association has created large numbers of awards. And the final issue is influence. So the first three we can count. Anybody knows how to measure influence, prestige, relevance? Well, that counts a lot for the rankings, but we don't know how to measure that. So three things that we measure, one that we can, to, we can estimate a little bit. So, in the first three, the one that appears to be the most objective for many governments and the one that is repeated in most documents, we examine, uh, later I will tell you a little bit more about this uh, research, but uh, we review a large number of uh, documents uh, that structure tenure and promotion in the US and Canada and the documents for all the Latin American systems for, uh, that regulate uh, incentives for the scholarly community. And this is the thing that everybody is obsessed. We need citations. But in this world of citations, not all citations are made equal. Some citations count, some citations don't count. So self-citations, in some countries are discounted, in other countries are accepted. So uh, it seems that the citation is an objective thing, but really um, it's not been that accepted. And it's creating a system of incentives that is quite complicated. The new element in this equation is that if the citations happen within the scholarly uh, ecology, there is something new that is uh, becoming a, a, a new standard, and is the issue of social media. Now, it's not only what you publish, where you publish, but also how you make your research available through social media. And in some universities, this is being regulated and promoted. In other universities, it's being regulated and repressed or punished. Uh, so we have a new reality that is creating this very stressful environment. It's so stressful that in the last year alone, I found several hundred articles talking about this phenomenon of how social networks are hurting research. And another thousand articles <laughs> saying how social media promotes research or a research culture. What I'm trying to convey to you is that this is a very fluid environment and there is no very clear um, system that help us individually and this is the key word, individually, to navigate this model. On the one hand, most of the 
uh, universities that we work and national systems of uh, research and science are declaring that we need to do interdisciplinary collaborative research. However, <laughs> in most of the countries that we reviewed the documents, all researchers are assessed individually. And in some countries, if you are the third author, your contribution is not counted. So I'm working now in a group that we are 40 from 30 some different countries. And the colleagues that were coming from Africa and Asia and Latin America were saying, uh, I don't know if I can collaborate in this project. Because, you know, if it's going to be alphabetically, if the order of the authors is going to be listed alphabetically, I'm going to be the last one. My university is not going to give me any reward for this, so I'm not going to work for this. So, again, another tension between do collaborative interdisciplinary work and being rewarded individually. And this is creating a system of uh, um, incentives that is not new, but all of us know that in embarking in our scientific and scholarly careers, there were two things that appealed to us in the past. Our curiosity, we wanted to know something about an issue, and that make us you know, start doing research, and then we say, well, maybe I'm good at that, and I can get a job, so that's one. Uh, but now, the system is pushing for another element, and it's the element of vanity. And so, what we have is a process that make us compete once against another, trying to get more citations, trying to get more funding, trying to be always the PI. In certain disciplines, this is well codified and people understand. In the social sciences and humanities, this is not working. Um, it's not working uh, for many reasons, but uh, this issue of vanity also has gender and racial and ethnic dimensions, uh, and we have research showing that you know, white males are <laughs> getting disproportionately more citations than their colleagues, female colleagues. This is creating another distortion uh, that we have in the system of peer review, which is fundamental for making our journals alive. Um, Many of our reviewers and researchers uh, are saying the same. I'm, I'm, I cannot contribute to the paper. I cannot make contributions to improve the paper. I have to look for the problems in this paper to try to reject as much as possible because the rejection rate of my journal counts in making it more prestigious. So, at some of the, at two of the organizations that I work, and I'm in the communications, publications committee of uh, the American Educational Research Association and the Comparative International Education Society, all the journal editors are saying exactly the same. We have to re-educate our reviewers to abandon that model of first reject and then contribute to try to say, okay, well, let's, let's contribute. Well, rejection is not what is going to make us better all the time. There are some attempts of uh, transforming journals in that direction, which is good, and I will talk more about that uh, towards the end. The other distortion is the one created by the famous impact factor. Uh, I assume that everybody here knows what the impact factor is, but you know, very briefly, it's an average of the number of citations that a journal 
get in the previous three years. Uh, it's an indirect measure of the quality of the individual articles. So this is uh, the important part. The impact factor or the journal citation record or the whatever the metrics that Cielo gives you and so on, they are for the journal and they are useful for the journals are not very useful to assess the quality of individual articles. And this is really well established. However, they serve a function that is to regulate scarce resources in the scientific community. In Latin America, we have outsourced the assessment of the quality of the articles to these companies. Why? And we are still trying to figure out that very good answer other than it creates a system of fictional merit because it doesn't measure articles. It is indirect. This system has created, again, a lot of stress. And in the UK, 40% of the scholars are reporting to be under stress. In our research with colleges in Canada, with universities in Canada and the US, uh, the number is very similar. So four out of 10 of all of us are suffering from stress. And when they're suffering from stress, they're also taking medicines. Not a very happy part. In other countries, like China, uh, this system of incentives is also creating a lot of distortions with a system that pays per article. Some universities, like mine, tried this model. Uh, we bankrupt the system. Because if it really works, your target, you, know, you are going to use a lot more money than the system affords. And finally, in terms of the distortions, it creates a, an imbalance that we know, we have plenty of data about males and females, uh, white researchers, and uh, racial minorities. And very important for us, and we are suffering this situation here for the last two days, uh, it gives priority to English over any other language, although last year there were, it was the second year in a row that there were more papers published in Chinese than in English. However, they still don't figure that high in the rankings. So, happy? No. For some of us, the, we, we suffer this situation now, uh, and we think that it's new. Um, and I'd like to remind you that uh, already in 1968, people were <laughs> suffering from the same. Uh, um, are you translating the jokes to John? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, it's not a new problem, but it's more acute right now. It's more acute, and now following the, the trend started by Ines and Judith, I'm also going back a little bit in history. For centuries, our communication as scientists was oral. This is the way we did it. The journal is an artifact that has over 300 years, and, you know, it has a very interesting story, uh, if you have time, uh, look at the relationship between the development of the press and the selling of the Pope's um, Bula Papal? Um, the, dispen the Pope's dispensation and uh, pornogra early pornographic literature. It's really fascinating. Without that, we don't have the press. Um, but it's also an important element that there is a feedback loop between science, between all of us, hmm? and science, the construction of empires, 
the process of colonization, the process of domination, wars, and capital accumulation. That is something that we've all been part. So, although many in this community don't enjoy talking about money, we will need to talk more and more about money and start thinking and asking more questions about the use of money. So, right now, the shift that we are seeing is that epistemic curiosity is still relevant, but the search for commercial interest and for you know, increase our salaries is becoming a dominant mode. So, there are continuities in our institutions. We go to any university and recognize, it's easy to recognize universities, some very classical, like the Sorbonne and Coimbra. The other element that we see as a continuity is this notion of we have to be alone. The, the, the scientist is working alone. The truth is that we don't work alone, but most of the systems of assessing and accountability are looking at this individual. And the same with the students. We know that students learn in communities of practice and they learn in groups, but we keep doing all these evaluations alone. There are very few places that we don't do that. And this idea of the university and the scholarly community as the accumulation of great readings that will end up in this graduation. So, this is a way of thinking about universities and scholarly communications, that the past is really big and determines the future. I'm going to challenge that. And I'm going to show some discontinuities. So, I don't remember who said that it, oh, our colleague from Japan that had a very short history, five minutes of Japan, I'm going uh, to try to follow your guidance and I will do a short history of higher education. Uh, the numbers in yellow are the numbers of students and the names of the institutions. So we have, between the innovations, if you want, from the Greek academies or the Egyptian universities to the next transformation of universities, the medieval universities, there were 1,500 years. And we started with 30 students in the Greek academies and 100 more or less students per year in the medieval universities. 300 years, we have the private, private because it was before the nation state, so the notion that there were public universities, Sorbonne or Bologna, is a little bit uh, contested. I say private and public selective universities, they have a thousand students, 300 years. 200 years later, we have now what we consider public mass universities. Oops. Only 60 years later, we have online universities with 60,000 students. And now we have in the last 20 years, the creation of international for-profit universities with 100,000 students. And more recently, the advent of MOOCs with a million new students. So, continuities, yes. But when you change the scale at the speed and the quantity that we are seeing now, we have a different scenario. It's not the same. I always remind people that we talk about the American universities. And um, we usually talk about Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and so on. Uh, but there are 4,500 universities in the US. And the larger number of universities in higher education, I'm changing the category now, are in community colleges. 65% of all students in higher education in the US community colleges. They transfer, so they start community colleges or they could finish, but uh, we need to understand that this is a different, the scale is very different. And we need to 
understand that because the scale is very different, the amount of money that we are using is very different, and then systems of accountability are also adapting. Another element to, to consider. This is a time in history that we have more people school or educated than ever before. And the number is 1.4 billion students of those 200 in universities, 200 millions, and there are 61 million teachers and faculty. And this is a number that will continue unless artificial intelligence will discover a good way of replacing all of us. You know the data about digital reach, but perhaps this is something that you are not that aware. Uh, while our students use social networks for learning, studying, accessing to the research, very few of the faculty use it in the same proportion. I'm not tweeting about this. I'm not posting about Facebook. My colleagues that are 15 years younger, they will be tweeting while they are talking. And my university will give me an incentive if I tweet and, Facebook and post while I talk. I just, I'm lazy. That's it. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> this is the, the other element that is really important. We have all the systems of ac accountability because among many things, we are spending a tremendous amount of money. And this will continue to increase. And the more money we are spending, the more the pressure for accountability. In that 1.6 trillion dollars, there is a small portion that goes to journal articles, and I'm counting only journal articles in English. But you can see the progression from 2006 to 2018. 3 million articles. And the same applies to Latin America, Africa, Asia. Every single region has increased the output. But think about your own production. Have you increased the speed that you can read? No. Do you increase the number of citations or you know, the bibliography? Some people are doing that using artificial intelligence. But our capacities are very limited. As uh, it was discussed yesterday, the plan S is, uh, is changing the landscape the proposal from Latin America led by the Amelica coalition is, is getting stronger and is entering into the conversation. Uh, Canada and the US are moving slowly in between. We see how that is going to work. But last year there were 33,000 <laughs> journal articles um, uh, peer review journals in English. Every year we create new journals. Some because we need, there are new fields that are emerging that need new journals. But because those journals cannot automatically get into the journal citation records or the impact factors, many of those are punished and they have to endure punishment from their organizations. Some journals innovate and, and can get away from this and I will talk a little bit more about those innovations later, but this is very difficult. The other thing that is very difficult and you know this from your own 
units and colleges, is that the practices of citation, of counting citations, uh, is very different by field. While 80% of medicine articles are cited at least once, once, uh, that number goes to 73% in the natural sciences, 32% in the social sciences, and 18% in the humanities. And it's, you know, this is more or less constant over the last 100 years. And 80% of all citations correspond to 20% of the researchers. The new category created by Clarivate and Web of Science of highly cited researchers. And I will, I think that uh, I have the different presentation, uh, just for, for fun. In 2016, Clarivate sent me an email saying, congratulations, Gustavo. You are one of the highly cited researchers. I live in the US. My salary, Flaxo doesn't pay me. My salary is coming from the US. Um, so I went to my dean with the email and says, hey, I'm one highly cited researcher. I have no idea why they made that, but this is what you do in the US. You are in a research intensive university. If you get one of those awards, uh, that was considered an award, uh, you go and ask for a salary increase. And I got a salary increase. But two months later, Clarivate sent me another email saying, we made a mistake. <laughs> it was the Fishman GE, but the one that works in neuroscience. I disclosed that, but I retained the salary increase. So I drink the Kool-Aid. We are having a, we live in this system where we have incentives and punishments, but the punishment is a lot harsher than the incentives. What's my evidence for that? As I told you before, we did a research reviewing the systems in Latin America and then that's similar in uh, Canada and the US. And we look for the words, among other many things, but what were the words associated to the public mission of universities in the statements, the goals, the mission statements of the universities? And as you can see, public goes with service and professional service and not very much uh, associated with research. And when we look for the same in the statements about research, the big thing is impact. And when we look for the indicators of impact, the one that dominates is the impact factor. In the case of the US, the chances of you publishing in a high impact factor are moderate. But in the case of Latin America, are marginal. So we have a system of science and research in Latin America that is more concerned with what we don't have and a system that is bias against the production in the region and that's a system that is incentivizing research and production and that has created a model in which almost all the journals are following systems of production and publication that perhaps were useful 40 years ago, but not today. Most of the journals in Latin America are still publishing in 
as if they were printed. They are online, digital, but they still have issues, volume, most journals publish, okay, let's say 40, 50 articles a year, because the opposition between quality and quantity uh, seem to, to be the dominant one. Um, all the new emerging journals are going into continuous publication, more interdisciplinary, with developmental reviews, with open reviews, adopting the notion of open science, and many of them open access, although uh, there is a debate about what type of open access they are using. Uh, in Latin America, we try to be open access, sponsored by the public sector. In North America, Canada, and Europe is uh, open access paid by, also now with Plan S, by governments or with article processing fees. In the, scholarly, the, the multiple scholarly <laughs> communications associations that uh, we attend, uh, there is a consensus that we cannot keep doing this. Uh, what we are doing is adopting simplistic models that are simple, elegant sometimes, but they are wrong. And they are wrong because they are not helping us to produce better science. They are very good at regulating the academic career of all of us. But to what extent they are producing better science, this is something that we need to debate. So we need to change and we need to rethink the orientation of our scientific journals. But I would say, I like to read in paper. I, I, when I read fiction, and novels, I get the books, I, I get the paper. I'm, my quota of nostalgia and tango crying is in the books. But with the journals, we don't need to continue with that model. We shouldn't continue with that model. It's punishing us. It's creating a system that is not conducive to produce more, better, more accessible, more usable science. So the past is important. But if you think about higher education today, research and development, the future is a lot bigger. So we need to remember and honor our traditions, but we don't need to keep doing or maintaining the system of publications of the last 40 years. I'm going to add a caveat. Uh, Judith is here. I love the, the whole issue of the caveat. Uh, I still believe that books matter. And we did, a, a, this is just for the field of education. I don't know if what I'm going to say extends to other fields. But uh, the most influential scholars in the field of education in the US publish articles, but the reputation, remember that thing of the influence, is based on books. And their books are more cited than their articles. I'm talking about Linda Darling Hammond, Diane Ravitch, Paulo Freire, if you want. It's like the book is an object that still is very much used, at least in that field. I'm not making claims about other fields. So, we have today two modes about thinking about scholarly publications. The first is zero sum game that quantity is opposed to quality. If I gain in one, I'm going to lose in the other. That I, if I want to innovate, I'm going to lose the stability and the sense of security of the tradition. And that if uh, favors private or individual gains, it's going to go against the public. And that if I want to favor the local knowledge or things that matter in my local community, it's not going to be good for the global epistemic community. And I think that that in the world of journals, <laughs> but, uh, that's not true. 
uh, there are tensions, and we need to manage those tensions. Those tensions between the same categories, but you can do it. You can play with different um, dimensions that will allow you to respond to the demands of your field. I publish a journal that um, is in the field of education. It publishes in three languages. And for 20 years, Clarivate always told us that uh, we were never going to be indexed by Web of Science uh, because they thought that the journal had one version that was the good journal and two pirate versions. Because every time you change the language, it opens into a separate website. So when you enter the journal in English, it ends with you know, the domain in English. When you go to the page in Portuguese, it opens a new page, and they thought that they were, because it was the same number for the journal, they thought that we were doing something you know, uh, fraudulent. Uh, we explained at least 20 times that it was the same journal and three languages. And then they said, well, we will index you, but just the English part. And of course, I say, no way. We are one journal. Uh, and then they said, well, you don't publish a regular number of articles. And if you don't publish a regular number of articles, we cannot calculate the impact factor because you change the number of articles every year. And I say, no, we will continue to do that. Uh, and so finally, <laughs> without us saying anything, uh, last week or two weeks ago, they said, well, yes, um, we are indexing you, uh, but we would like you to consider not to index the Spanish and Portuguese section because that will lower your impact factor. And we say no again. We are going to have an impact factor. We have no idea how they are going to calculate that, but uh, for the, the, and we are going to be one of the few journals in Spanish and Portuguese index in Clarivate not in the secondary, um, what's the name of the, no, no scope, uh, uh, Web of Science has a core collection and emerging, with not in the emerging, we are in the core collection, but it's insane. That company is pushing journals to adapt behaviors and to publish in an outdated, antiquated model because it's easier for them to index. It doesn't have anything to do with quality, scholarly rigor, contribution to science, nothing. It's easier for them. And the sad truth is that most journals are adapting to that model. It's wrong. We know it's wrong. So, please, if you edit journals, abandon that. <laughs> to start finishing, uh, how to prevent publish and perish? You know, sign DORA, adapt the principles of DORA. Everybody is aware of the DORA declaration, the research assessment declaration of San Francisco, and the very simple demand of DORA is do not use indirect metrics of journal quality to assess the quality of the individual researcher or the individual project. It's a very simple demand. As you can see, more than 1,500 universities and organizations are already signing DORA. Uh, for the Latin Americans and the Mexicans, very few in Mexico, so push for that, please the same in Argentina, and almost 15,000 researchers worldwide. We need to go back to the idea of assessing research requires 
to read the research and to be patient. The scholar that discovered the Zika, the Zika virus discovered that in 1950s. His published paper got an accumulated number of citations of seven over 60 years. In 2015, one of the most cited papers. He should deserve the highly cited researcher and the salary increase, but you know, he was dead. We need to go back to reading. We need to spend the money in places that make sense if improved science, not to the administration of our academic careers. Oh, there is a typo there. Um, and for that, what we need to do is to start asking our institutions to support not only our scientific, but also our educational, our economic contributions, our political contributions, our social contributions, our cultural contributions by mobilizing our research. And by mobilizing, I'm saying making it more accessible and more usable. And usable is not an indication of practice, is how much our societies can engage with this, um, with our scholarly production. Uh, it's not, when we started working on knowledge mobilization, we thought that it was something that the individual researchers were able to do. Uh, and now we know that it's a fantasy. We cannot be good researchers, good writers, good presenters, uh, good at podcasts, good at uh, YouTube, good at... That is something that requires special knowledge, special skills that our institutions need to do. And why our institutions need to do that? Because we cost a lot of money. Our, the public supports us. The public needs to have access, but needs to have access in a way that they could engage. If we don't engage, if we don't make this accessible, the public is going to keep uh, mistrusting us. And that is going to be very, very painful. I don't think that we need to go back to the golden age of universities that in every different country is you know, a different period. In Argentina it was the 60s, in Brazil it was the 70s, and Mexico, I don't know. Uh, in the US, they always go back to you know, the launching of the Apollo mission as the golden age. For me, the golden age is today. Because this is the time of universities and the scholarly community that is larger, more diverse, more inclusive, more heterogeneous, and the future is going to increase the presence of people like us. But we need to demand from the public and from our institutions a different type of support. If they keep counting our contributions as the little points at the individual level, we are not going to be producing better science. There are plenty of examples of how to do that. Many universities are doing that. We need to push our organizations to do that. And one simple first step is adopting the principles of the DORA Declaration. It's not costly, but it's more sane. It will reduce the level of stress among us. It will increase the opportunities to collaborate, to do more interdisciplinary research, and to serve the public. If we don't serve the public, we are going to be history. So, thank you. <laughs>